the real definition of pride in some respects. It is to think you're better than someone or to behave like you're better than someone. It, it definitely feels that, like that sometimes with the, all the rainbow flags everywhere and the pronouns. And, you know, you have to participate in this culture. And if you don't participate in this culture, if you're just a, a cis het, white, whatever, then you're not really part of our, our culture anymore. You're just, you're just boring. Us sparkly people with our different gender and sexual identities that are, are the ones that need to be paraded and um, looked up to in our culture these days. Welcome to the New Flesh Podcast, the podcast you deserve. My name is Ricky Orpike and joining me once again is my good friend, Mr. Jonathan Astro. How are you, sir? I'm good. And it's good that you're getting a bit formal, Ricky. You should treat me with a bit more respect. Thank you. <laughs> Do, do you like a, a, a social gathering? Yeah, yeah. Are we talking, if we're, if you're thinking what I'm thinking, which is that we all get naked and put eyes wide shut masks on, then yes. Is that what we're thinking? Or <laughs> No, no. Oh, not shit. At all. Oh, well, then no, I don't. <laughs> cut this bit out. Cut this bit out. <laughs> cut it out. Cut it out. <laughs> no, we are not. We are talking to uh, Dara McDonald today about uh, her All Minus One, which is kind of like a, a, a an open social gathering where you discuss topics and. She can she can explain it better than I can. Evidently. Get on with the show. <laughs> Dara McDonald is a lawyer and founder of All Minus One, a cultural organization for thinkers, creatives, and tastemakers that unapologetically defends freedom of speech and protects and promotes liberty as a core Australian value. I'll take a breath now. Prior to founding the group, she was a research fellow at the Institute of Public Affairs. She has published work in The Australian and The Spectator and also has a substack titled The Conservative Vagabond. Dara, welcome to The New Flesh. Great to be here. Now, you started an underground members club a while back called All Minus One. Can you tell us about this group and what it's all about and why you started it? Well, I'll, I'll start at the very beginning. What I really wanted to do was to have a free speech festival in Australia, a bit like the Battle of Ideas or something like that overseas, where they not just invite people to give talks, but they invite, you know, comedians to come give a rambunctious, uh, you know, stand-up comedy club and all these sorts of things. So it's not just a talk fest, it's a, you know, battle of ideas over many pla- over many mediums. Um, and I know some, some of the people that, you know, display art and so on in the UK that go to these, these events. Um, so that was my inspiration of having, of wanting a, a festival essentially in Australia, not just a, a conference like CPAC or all these sorts of things. There's lots of uh, conservative or I, I guess, you know, not even conservative, but, you know, centrist, liberal-minded uh, places where you can go to talk about ideas, but there's not so many places where um, which focus on the cultural aspect of things. I mean, the, 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 the talk, you know, talks are great. I love talks and I would, wouldn't not put those on, but um, it would be really about bridging all the different mediums together. Um, so that was my initial desire. But then when I looked around Australia, I had no idea who I would invite to such a thing. <laughs> so they're kind of anyone that is kind of um, not on board with the work agenda and sits in the sort of cultural space are pretty uh, in the closet, shall we say. Um, and so my my idea with starting a members club was to bring these people out of the woodwork a bit more to have a space which is not just about uh, politics as well that's one of the core values that I I try and steer as much as possible I mean unfortunately politics seem to invade everything at the moment you can't really escape it but to as much as possible avoid politics and actually you know far more focus on more all-pervasive long-term values and goals so that was that was basically the idea of, of not not uh, being able to start a festival and not seeing how that would work in Australia at the moment um, to try and create a space where I can find the people that eventually might you know might put together a festival or something in the in the future. So basically, it it, it is the the precursor to bringing people out of the woodwork that at the moment are. I kind of, you know, in the closet a little bit. Well, you know? I went along to one of these uh, just, just, just to, and and it was uh, a discussion on architecture, 
um, uh, and you had two speakers. I won't I won't out them, but you had you had you had two speakers, and uh, they had very differing point of uh, points of view. And it was a it's a, a small room, uh, a nice intimate space in in a pub in Sydney, and it did feel like we were we were coming up with the gunpowder plot or something, you know, like like being <laughs> hidden away in the yeah. rocks there. And yeah. but it was a, it was a, it was a a, 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 a fascinating event and it's interesting hearing you talk about it so it's it's not just a a a a talk you're trying to get uh um spirited discussion right yeah i mean i i'm trying to that was a particularly interesting one because i had you can out them because you know i've outed them on twitter them myself um the the speakers were james morrow and parnell mcginnis james is obviously with uh you know the News Corp and ha- goes on Sky News and has a number of programs on Sky News and Parnell is not your typical Fairfax columnist, but she is a Fairfax columnist and goes on the ABC and so on. Um, they don't have two differing opinions, but in this particular instance in, in the realm of architecture, they had quite different views and that's why I brought them in to, to talk about that. Um, so that was that was a very interesting event for me. I that was the one that I told everyone about, and I'm not sure if that's going to work. I'm like, okay, no, trust me on this one. This will be fun. <laughs> it certainly was. Um, it was. Uh, it was, and it, I think it delivered in spades. And and I was I was I was uh, totally engaged. Yeah, no, it was a it was a great discussion, and they they're very. I mean, they're both presenters in their own right, so they they brought a lot of energy to the discussion, shall we say? And the, the one thing which I really like about the intimate venue and I have some, you know, big, quite big guests coming to the next one. And I was thinking, oh, I don't know if we're going to fit into the venue and so on and so forth, but I'd much rather pack a whole bunch of people onto a small venue and they could be intimate and have also everyone at eye level. I mean, this is something that is probably um, a bit controversial in, in the conservative space, but one thing that people say when they come to an all minus one event as opposed to some of the other events that are on offer is that everyone sits around in a table. It's all, you know, it's all in the round. Everyone can participate in the discussion. There's no kind of hierarchy, you know, and also that most of the time we eat together, we break bread together, and it's, it's actually a proper social experience. That was a bit different because we had two very much two speakers, but usually we're sitting around the table with these, these guests of honour of sorts, and, you know, we're, we're ha- everyone has a chance to grill them as much as possible as well so it's it creates a a bit more of a bonding experience and you know if you go to something like CPAC or something like this then you have very much a strated situation where the VIPs go off into their room to have lunch and then you know the plebs go off and have to you know buy their own sandwiches and stuff like this but if you if you want to create a movement you actually need to have everyone together because that's where you know the bonds form, um, and actually, people with different skill sets can come together and create something. Yeah, well, it seems like you've tried to resurrect the old school contract we used to have before phones and social media, where speakers could be a little bit more candid, knowing that their words couldn't be put put in a YouTube clip, for ex- for example. Like, but but is it is that a concern of yours at all that people start getting their phones out and recording the event and documenting uh, what people say? It's not really so much for concern. Um, I have had a mun- bunch of people ask me whether I was going to create a forum on the back end of the website and various other online discussion pages, which I have done. I have actually done the work of putting um, putting together a back end of the website where people that are members can sign in and start discussion boards and stuff like that. But I haven't launched it because I'm, I'm sort of in two minds about it. I like the fact that it's, you know, it's in the flesh, you know, it's um, an in-person event where people are not on their phones, they can't take things out of context, they, they have to, you know, look the person in the eye before prodding them. The other thing is, even, you know, I'm, I'm as free speech as they get, but I have run groups in the past where I've had discussion boards and stuff like that, and you do have to monitor them slightly, you know. There is, there is no such thing as not being able to throw your hat in the ring when it comes to people's discussion, apparently. I, you know, every, everyone, even a group that is 
was expressly free speech people would come to me and say hey you need to remove this or hey you need to remove that i'm like oh I have a full time job. I don't want to remove people's speech. It's that added level of, to, in of admin that you just don't want in your life, is it? Yeah. But but I recently went to yeah. see Dave Chappelle play, uh, d- do a stand up routine with a bunch of other uh, comics that came down under at, at Rod Laver Arena, which is a 14,000 seat venue, much, much bigger than the kind of venues and, and things you're putting on. But one thing they had were these special pouches where everyone had to lock away their mobile phones and it could not be unlocked unless you went out into the foyer and put it on this massive round, look like a magnety type thing that would unlock it. And then you could check your phone for whatever reason, then you had to lock it back up again, uh, which was fascinating to me because it, it just meant that the, the, the comedians, you know, first of all, they couldn't be do- documented. Things couldn't be taken out of context. They were free to try out their material if it was a bit on edge. And a lot of it was on edge. Uh, but I, I, I kind of like this idea because I don't think people can be trusted to put their phones away, you know. I, I've I've gotten to trouble mm. a few times in the past for, you know, confronting people at, at, at uh, cinemas for, you know, checking out their phone constantly and, you know, it just it drives me crazy. But do you think that's kind of the future, <laughs> like having to enforce like a ban on mobile phones in, in you know, events? That's an interesting concept. I, I think it's also – the tracks from the being in live experience as well. I mean, even I, I've occasionally pulled the phone out and go, oh, my God, this is amazing. You know, let's videotape this. Um, but but some people some people film an entire Radiohead concert while they're at the concert on their phone rather than experiencing it with their own eyes. You know, that, that's, that seems really strange to me. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah I'm a bit anti you know, anti too much technology, but I think it, it is something that needs to be each, you know, different mediums are different, you know, there's difference between going for an art gallery versus, you know, going to a live performance. And, you know, I, I respect the kind of the Dave Chappelle model of you, you lock your phone away, you do not take it out. I think that's excellent, actually. Um, it's you know, probably one of the perks of actually going there. No, I can't answer my phone and going to a Dave Chappelle concert. <laughs> um, I am I'm contactable. And, yeah, but I think, yeah, it's, it's something that I think every person in sort of the cultural space doing performance or art or something has, has to kind of navigate on their own. You know, it depends on, you know, what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to achieve clicks and want to go viral, then for sure you want everyone there with your phone out with as many followers as possible, you know, snapping photos and video. But, yeah, that's obviously as a very particular type of um, person in that instance. So your um, event is, as you said, more focused on on culture and not politics. Well, first, I got a question about that, but, but maybe you could elaborate on that. I mean, some people might be saying, what do you mean? Well, yes, that's. I think there is, there is a definite... Um, concept in particularly today's world that there's no such thing as no non-political like everything is politics and particularly um particularly on the left there's the idea that everything is political that the personal is political and there's no such thing as a non-political space my kinks are political <laughs> exactly exactly everything that happens in the bedroom is political and it's why we need to hear about it incessantly at a meeting <laughs> we need to hear about it um about the very beginning of the meeting yeah very, very strange times. I would disagree with that. I think there's definitely things outside of politics. By which I mean party politics, things that the government is doing. And they're always like temporary stats that we forget about in the next year, which is unfortunate sometimes. Sometimes it, it would be nice if we had a little bit more of a reckoning about what happened during COVID, for instance. But for the most part, these are, these are temporary stats that we're going through at the moment, you know, about the voice of parliament, which are, all of them are very significant, but the problem is, is that the next thing will happen and we'll be on to that. But I guess the, the cultural aspect of it is actually something that is more pervasive. You know, it's the, and by culture, I don't just mean art, I mean all the ideas that pervade our society at the moment, which in the end inform politics. So, you know, the, the old adage of, you know, po- politics is downstream of culture. I think it's a little bit more of a symbiotic relationship that sometimes, you know, politics can inform culture by the fact that, you know, we're all so sick of the politics, therefore we're reacting against it in some way. 
like I am. <laughs> um, but yeah, for the most part, it, it, it is it is taking what are more sort of broad ideas, more rooted ideas about you know what is a good life, you know what is beauty, what is what are good ideas in which you can implement in your day to day life and in your communities, and then maybe broaden that out to the whole society. But for the most part. It's, it's more about what we're doing right now in our sort of smaller enclaves of people, um, not so much about campaigning about, you know, against whatever the government's doing at any given time. And, and are you looking for people to start all minus one chapters around the country in, in different cities? Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, I'm looking in particular for Melbourne people at the moment because Ricky. I've had some interest. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm a busy I've had man, some John. Down there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've had some interest down there, but all the people that want to go to all, all minus one in Melbourne are also busy family people. It's just one of the downsides of having, you know, being in this space is that people are busy. They're not people that are, you know, lifelong activists that have time to, you know, <laughs> spend a heap of time campaigning for get up or something. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's but, just but, the way but, things but are. But given the yeah. way you structure the forum, it's it's more of a discussion between many different voices. There, would, whoever whoever ran the the Melbourne chapter, there would be less work than say if you had to get up every week and present or mediate or yeah. or sort of be the MC of write the, a paper of the every yeah, week, every week. Write a paper. Yeah, no, it's actually it's very low maintenance. I turn up once a month. Um, I do a bit of advertising, but obviously I. If I'm doing it for one event, it's not too much of an effort to do it for another one. Um, yeah, so it's a very low maintenance thing at the moment. I would love to add some more, and I've had um, some people in Sydney that want to help run it. So that also adds a different flavour because they're different people with different um, interests, shall we say? And so, yeah, it, it, it's it's more or less at the moment. It's more or less one once a month. But as more people become interested and more people are um, willing to help out and put stuff on, then, you know, hopefully it will grow into a bigger thing. Mm. Well, w- one thing we often talk about on, on this podcast is that, that we know we know of and we see so many people who are wrapped up in the culture war full time. They've made it their lifestyle and they've, they've forgotten about art and music and cinema and, and, and books, difficult books even. Um, and, and, and I often wonder, you know, what, what happens to these, these people who say, you know, may have podcasts that deal, you know, entirely on the culture wars. Like what happens when the culture wars over or the culture war shifts, you know, should we disengage from the culture war sometimes and social media and make time for cultural, cultural pursuit, pursuits? Absolutely. Um, I mean, it, it's, it is, you end up maybe with the St. Georgian retirement syndrome that Douglas Murray points out, but instead of it being LGBT, QI charities that are doing this, it, you could end up in a situation where if we win the war or if we win the battle or, you know, some of this, um, the tides turn slightly, then they might end up being stuck in this um, perpetual motion machine of finding the next outrage because that's what clicks and, you know, income and everything is based on. I mean, there has been a lot of talk about, uh, particularly in sort of the former IDW, Intellectual Dark Web space, if you follow that from a years back, that how they came in all different directions and all of them are incu- accusing each other of audience capture. But in some respects, you know, it's sort of inevitable that you get the feedback of my audience likes this kind of content, therefore I feed that more of this kind of content. Well, you see, some of those guys, some of those guys, they, they, they have become fixated on one issue as well. Like particularly Brett, Brett Weinstein yeah. is like, he is all in on ivermectin and, and COVID, you know, and it's sort of, it's, it's sort of warped his brain a little bit. Well, Sam Harris and oh, yeah, Donald. Sam Harris with oh. Donald Trump yeah. derangement syndrome. Yeah. I think, are we all in agreement here that we all, I, I mean, I used to listen to that guy all the time. Sam Harris. And ne- yeah. And now, like, uh, oh, you know, Dara, were you always sceptical of him? No, I, I, I used to listen to him a lot, but yeah, I, I, I just can't deal with his uh, Trump derangement and COVID derangement syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, I mean, I think, you know, he's a, he's a smart guy and if it was a little bit of criticism, I wouldn't mind, you know. But 
yeah, uh, uh, he definitely seems to have his biases there. But, I mean, everyone has biases. I mean, the other person which I used to listen to very frequently was Dave Rubin, but he's gone down more the politics route, you know, um, where I used to have guests on and they, you know, interview them and much, you know, much like what you're doing. Um, and I used to listen to him, you know, very lot, like a lot. Um, but now he does all these direct messages where he gives you the spiel of what he thinks. But well, we always talk about, about that. What, what, would, the what would we do if the blaze came? And then I think we'd probably just take the money, right, Ricky? <laughs> probably. Probably. And just yeah. then just start. Well, you know. I mean, if, if, Daily, if Daily Wire uh, offers you 50 million like they did Crowder, you'll take yeah. it. I would, I, I would say whatever <laughs> they needed me to say. I'd say stop the steal, uh, whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> would you would you wear the guns in the holsters? Yes, like? I would definitely, definitely. Uh, so, but 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 we can see the, how the culture shifts as well. So just to, just remember how how irrelevant is um, uh, religion now in terms of like was it like ten or or fifteen years ago there was this obsession with um, uh, uh, you know being yeah the, being atheist. I'm th- yeah. It's- being atheist, like the new atheist, the, mm. you know, the Sam, and this is where Sam Harris, you know, first, I first noticed him because particularly that, um, that notorious interview that he did ben with, Affleck. uh, Ben Affleck. I mean, yes. that was, was just a fantastic, cra- cha- uh, train it was delicious. Um, it was delicious. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So, so, you know, the Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Dan Dennett, all these, all these people, that, and obviously Dawkins, um, that that ro- rose to prominence as the four ho- horses of you know the atheist, new atheists, and then everything shifted. And then it was the intellectual dark web moment, and you know your Brett and Eric Weinstein and all that sort of stuff. There now it's it's interesting that it's shifted again, and it's much more into this uh, new right, deep right space. Which is fascinating as well. I don't know if you've you followed the kind of the shifts into, you know, the more sort of subversive elements of the online right. But 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 don't you think we should be able to, uh, like I listened to a bit of Sam recently and I was like I still like him, you know, and 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 yeah. and as you say, he's yeah. really smart. And I'm trying to get to the point where um, I'm if if you agree, like it's not even about agreeing with people. Like it's about giving people a bit of leeway. Like I'm not talking about necessarily like saying that you're going to have dinner with Alex Jones and Kanye West. Um, I'm saying (laughs) like if someone, but, but yeah, probably absolutely. (laughs) But, 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 but but if you, but if you pretty much, if the person's interesting and well humored and they've got some mad ideas, but I mean, basically you agree on a whole bunch of things. Why are we getting to, why are we at this point where, you've got to go on Twitter and denounce someone or do snide remarks on your podcast or, you know, and, and I mean, even about that mad stuff that, that Sam Harris said, like, I'm like, oh, well, like, that's not my view. And um, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's enti- he can have his views, of course. I, yeah, I just, um, yeah, there's not, I'm not saying that he, he, he shouldn't say those things or, you know, and, and also even when he has interesting guests on, I usually, I listen to his podcast when he, when he has someone particularly interesting in on I guess I guess this is the the downside of being part of the cultural war and obviously he's taken some positions on things which I disagree with and that's fine but the fact that um he feels he has to ram home those positions as opposed to you know do the things that he he does really well you know is is something which is interesting like that you have that people that and, I mean, I'm taking Sam as an example, but he, it could be anyone. But he, he's really good on the, you know, the meditation, the spirituality. What these sorts of things are really amazing um, imports that he has created. Um, but yet he feels the need to, you know, go into the political space. I mean, that's all the same with, you know, Dave Rubin. He used to do have conversations, and now he feels the mm-hmm. need to go into the political space and all this sort of stuff. And I, yeah, it's not a down. It's not a. Uh, dig on them is just noting that this is something that has clearly happened in these circles where people are public intellectuals. They feel the need to have a an opinion and not just a, an opinion, but a very, very uh, hard-headed opinion about yeah. different Yeah, well, things. just on that, like Sam Harris, when, when he did appear on, on the Trigger Pod and he did say that bad stuff about Hunter Biden, like 
one of the first reactions I, I had was is like the meditation doesn't seem to be ha- helping you there, bro. You know, like <laughs> yeah, you, That's good you, point. Seem, you yeah. seem to be a really, really hot butt under hurt. the collar. You seem a bit butt hurt. <laughs> yeah, about anything yeah. to do with Trump. <laughs> like how 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 is that a good advertisement for your meditation app? You know, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, I guess the, the, that's the thing is that, you know, these all, they're all human, you know, no matter how many followers you have on Twitter or how much of a public intellectual you are, you're, everyone's human. They're all going to have their little hang-ups and things. And I guess that's just, that is just it. That's just the, well, you know, that's the, pro- that's part of the, uh, the, what comes, comes along with having so much of your life public, you know, previously it would be that you, you, the people that we saw on TV, we would only see them on TV, but now we see all their tweets, all their, you know, public doubts with different people. Um, and I guess that's just, it, it's, in some ways it's kind of nice that we see, see you know, not just the, the perfection, but also. No, I wish, I'd, I, wish I didn't know what Stephen King thought about stuff. <laughs> that's just one example I wish Rob Reiner I didn't know it. I love Rob Reiner and I wish I didn't know any of the things he thinks oh he says awful stuff on Twitter doesn't he <laughs> he's not he's not good <laughs> anyway anyway the, uh, uh, perhaps zooming out a little bit Dara with the culture so divided which is what we've been talking about and arguably arguably the arts and institutions completely captured by one group uh, for the moment do you do you personally create a, a monastery of the mind? Uh, this could be surrounding yourself with certain art, culture, books, uh, and controlling your input in terms of, of what you take in. Yeah, I mean, I do try to. Um, yeah, I, I do try to, and I try to read a lot as well. I try to more. I try to um, remove the screen. I used. To, I haven't done it for a little while, but I used to have like screen free Sundays where I just turned the computers off completely. Wow. Mm. You know. Please don't look at the phone. Don't look at the, what happens? the computer or anything. Uh, what happens or what happens? <laughs> yeah, what happens? When you do that, what happens? Ah, <laughs> uh, it's just nice. It's just nice because you don't feel like. Let me write that down. It's just nice. I'm going to try it. Is it? It's just nice. Is it like yeah. that movie where you where you put the glasses on? Or what's that horror movie and you see all the people as they really are? What what is that? Oh, they live. The they John live. John Carpenter movie. Yeah. Is it like that? You see everyone as skeletons. And... No, no. I'm probably the inverse, actually. That's. It's, <laughs> oh, that's good. Has a little bit more rose coloured tints. <laughs> um. Yeah. I don't know. I I find it quite easy to be honest. I don't I don't hook into it so much. Sometimes I really do. Um. And for instance, that. For the last week, I've been glued to Twitter over that uh, uh, the issues with Kelly J. Yes, Keen coming to Sydney to Australia. I've and I've been like I've I been done I've, that I've been ages. I've been like um, Mark Zuckerberg at the end of the um, the Social Network, just refreshing, just going, tick, the refreshing, just going. Oh my god! I get because everything that whole affair was just it took over my brain. It did, and that was a really amazing because I haven't had that for ages. I had I've been a little bit distant. I don't I don't. Um, I don't consume news anymore, so I don't consume news on the day. I consume analysis after the fact. <laughs> so mm. I leave it a week and then I read about the things that happened the week, you know, week of, rather than consuming daily news. I think that's much healthier because otherwise you get swept up into the daily outrage culture. So that's one thing I, re- I do. I do less screens and, um, and don't consume daily news. Mm. Yeah, well, since you you mentioned Kelly J. Keane, did, did did you happen to attend any of the rallies, or and and what were your thoughts on the whole the whole affair? I didn't. I was going to go to the Sydney one, but I ended up forgetting that it was on. <laughs> so I I completely. I was like, oh yeah, I should go to that when it's when she's here, and then I completely forgot about it. Probably also because I had an all minus one event mm. that weekend as well, so it was I was double whammied. Um, well, it's good. It means no one's coming after your job as well. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I would, I would have gone otherwise, but it, it was interesting just to see the fallout from it because it, in some ways it's so – if you would have told me a few years ago that the biggest taboo in our society in a few years' time will be saying that women are men and different, I would not have believed you. Let's, it would have been like – Completely unbelievable, but yes, this is where we but are. It's more than basically. that, though, isn't it? It's women. It's that women don't have penises. 
<laughs> like it's not just that they're a little yes. bit different. Like like that's the thing you would have to go back to 2008 <laughs> and say to yourself and say, by the way, in a few years, like it, that'd be like one of those like Back to the Future Part Two or something, a nightmarish future. You'd be telling them about like, oh, in the future, you you if you said that a woman doesn't have a penis and that that you know the rest of it, the person would would just be like, you come from a dystopia. Yeah, I, it's totally crazy. I don't I actually don't understand it. And this is the thing, it's like, um, you know, I do, I do see, you know, Kelly J is, po- aka Posey Parker, she is a bit bombastic about it. But in some ways, you need to be because you see the other side and they're also completely nuts. So it's, you, and, you know, you look at the, the counter protest and particularly with the scenes that we saw in New Zealand, they were just completely mental. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's a real shame because I do actually feel for a lot of the, the non-activist trans people that are stuck in the middle of this and say, hey, I just wanted to be left alone, you know? Mm. But I, I wasn't trying to be, you know, housed in a women's prison, like, <laughs> you know, and, and it serves no one to have this kind of, this level of rhetoric because obviously, you know, the, the women's aspect of this, of, of, you know, putting convicted rapists in women's prisons also, another thing that if, if you went back to your, you know, yourself in 2008 and said, oh, and by the way, we're going, we're, in a few years' time, they will, be, they will put a, a convicted rapist in a woman's prison and they will call it, um, you know, uh, progress and being kind. And that, that, that would be also completely outrageous because it, it seems to be like, you know, it's one of those things that are completely no-brainer. That's the low-hanging fruit, you know. Maybe don't put convicted mm. rapists if they identify as women in women's prison. And then you have all the, the percolating up effects of that. You know, you've got the uh, women's bathroom issue, which bathrooms not so bad, but change rooms, hmm, yeah. that's a bit different. Um, but but what's, what's interesting, though, I think, you know, if, if you look at the old-school gay rights movement, you know, they were very much about you know, the government, you know, get out of our bedrooms, just let us be who we want to be. Just, we just want to do what we, what we do privately and in our own homes or whatever, or just live our lives. But it seems like the the trans side of the debate, like they want government to get involved. They want the flags everywhere. They want to be, you know, the, the, the day of visibility and the, the pride month and, you know, the pride day and, and the, the, yeah. the pride year, like, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's a different thing. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I definitely feel like it felt like it's gone from whatever you do in the privacy of your own bedroom is fine. And, and it's, take, it's, it's, it's a, a privacy argument. Originally, that was the, the argument for decriminalization and acceptance of homosexuality. But now, it's, now it seems to be, you don't, it's not just tolerance, it's you have to, valorize it it has it's yeah. better than being straight you're just you know you're just a you're just a cis straight person you know you don't have anything special about you and yeah it, it's interesting because it it, it, is, it is really a it is it is actually the real definition of pride in some respects it is to think you're better than someone or to behave like you're better than someone it, it definitely feels that like that sometimes with the, all the rainbow flags everywhere and the pronouns and you know, you have to participate in this culture. And if you don't participate in this culture, if you're just a, a cis het, white, whatever. Guilty. Then, Guilty as charged. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, then you're, you know, you're, you're not really part of our, our culture anymore. You're just, you're just boring. It's, it's us sparkly people with our, you know, different gender and sexual identities that are, are the ones that need to be paraded and, um, looked up to in our culture. Well, well, I, I just had this thought, you know, can can I label myself a queer heterosexual man? Can that can that be my label? Then I then I'll be on the on the cool kid side, you know. I'm sure you can. I'm sure it, it's all self identified these days. I I was listening to a podcast the other day about um uh, one with the one with Chris Williams, the Modern Wisdom podcast, and they were talking about how many the change in how many people have identified as uh bi now oh, yes mm. and then done the survey of have you ever had a sexual experience with a member of the same sex and they don't relate 
There's lots of people that identify as bi that have never slept with a member of the same yeah. sex. Yes, we talked about this with Eric Kaufman. Uh, he's done studies on this yeah. and he introduced. He also introduced a term I'd never heard before. What was it called? Uh, was it political lesbianism? Oh, yes, political lesbianism. I have actually heard that one before because um, I, I read Mary Harrington a yes. lot. Uh, she's an unheard journalist, uh, writer, and she just... I just read her book, um, Fem- Feminism Against Progress. Anyway, she tells the story that she used to be a political lesbian. So, you know, now I've learned all about political lesbianism because so, I read can, that Can book. you give us a definition? <laughs> I, I, I need schooling. <laughs> um, well, it's basically women that forego men, including even if they're, you know, technically heterosexual, but, you know, women's, you know, sexuality has always been joked about of being a bit like spaghetti, as in straight until wet. Um, and, yeah, so, so they, they forego men and start relationships with women because they it's a, an act of feminism, it's an act of rebelling against the patriarchy. But part of me feels you're... like, you know, and, you know, some of the feminists we've spoken to can, can t- have a talking to, to me about this, but... Um, I feel like if you're serious about it, then maybe that's what you should do. You know what I mean? Like if we're, if you're really, yeah. if you're all in, then you got to go, go the distance. I say. Yeah. Well, more power to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, goodness. I have no, I have no problem with people being political lesbians or political gays. Like there's not such a thing as political gays, unfortunately. But you know, but maybe that's the next frontier. But by, but, but this, this, this um, fascinating rise in in. Uh, what do we? What un, unactioned by people is is the same, well, similar sort of deal. I feel like it's just a, it's just a, a little pillbox that you can like a, like in a wartime you know setting that you can just run into a bit like the word queer. Like when you when you when you're not sure when you're worried about your status or your job or or your friend group, yeah. you can just go, oh goodness, I'm I'm bi, I guess, mm. uh, or I'm queer. I think- the other one is like demisexual. Have you heard of that one? That have, all the yeah. celebrities that have been yes. coming out as demisexual. It basically means that you you prefer intimacy, emotional, you know, being emotionally intimate before you have sexual intimacy. We used to call this being a female, but um, today boring. you can you can get. <laughs> but um, today you can you can use it as a label and be you know unique your new, unique and get an, and, and it, get an so. arts grant. Yeah, exactly. Well, you, you penned an article recently for The Spectator about a trend where single women are encouraging others to engage in some self-love by doing things like, you know, take yourself out on a date. Um, and, and this idea has probably been in the zeitgeist for a little while, but you mentioned a recent Miley Cyrus song where the lyrics in the chorus, uh, I think, uh, I can love me better. Uh, what's going on with all this self-love stuff? And, and are, some, are some women embracing this as a substitute to romantic relationships, do you think? Well, yes, that was sort of my contention is that this is a bit of a, in, in internet terms, you call it a cope. You know, it's, it's I, I would really like to do X, but um, because I can't do X, I'm going to promote Y um, type of situation. And I guess, I guess it's not... I, I did have a little bit of pushback from people saying, oh, you know, I like taking myself out. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with, you know, I, I do it all the time. I take myself out, not on a date necessarily, but, you know, I take myself out to dinners and whatever the case may be, you know. There's, not, there's nothing wrong with um, treating yourself But, but you wouldn't bit, call that a date though, would you? No. <laughs> no, no, you wouldn't. Uh, and that, that, is the, that is the really significant thing is that, What is called self-love is, you know, using all the trappings of big romance, should we say, the the candles, the, the, you know, you know, the dinners, um, et cetera, and, uh, and giving it to yourself as a date. But then that's not a date, you know, that's, that's just buying yourself some candles and a dinner. Uh, The date bit is where you actually have someone to talk to and, um, you know, and, and have a really a deep connection, particularly if, you know, your most couples have a date night where they, they go out and they, you know, make the relationship the, the priority on that night, which, you know, is generally considered a very good thing to do, not that I'm, I'm in that boat. But I guess, I guess the, the difference is, is that instead of having a partner to do those things with, 
um, they do them themselves. And the problem is, is that it's, it's not communal. It's not, it's not forming a bond with anyone. It's merely just, you know, participating in, in the, the consumeristic culture of self-love rather than having it, it as a, a, a reason to have a deep connection and, uh, you know, talk about the things that you need but to talk about. Dara, isn't, isn't this essentially, and I am generalizing, but isn't this essentially a female uh, version of a sex doll? You know, like a, a man, yeah. <laughs> we just we cut straight to it. We say, anyway, I'm, I want a robot that does all of that, and then the, 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 that's a cope, right? And then and then the female version, I would imagine, would be this whole, you know, treat yourself, get your, get the Sunday, get the get the wine. It's fine. It's all good. Like you know, I'm just gonna you know. I've, I, I, but when you strip it all back, but both extremes are avoiding the obvious point is that they are solitary and oh, I don't know, I just, I'm not convinced we're meant to be solitary. I am also neither convinced that we're meant to be solitary. I wrote a, a piece um, two years ago for Matilda, the sort of women's magazine um, about love in the age of algorithms. And I made the point that actually in the future, it's not that far off with chat GBT four, I would say, is that, I wonder if it would be the women that would fall more for, you know, the disembodied machines, the AI. If if she could put her phone out and also have a date with Mr. AI, you know, for the wine, go, oh, hi, dear, how are you doing? And they would talk back and, you know, write poetry and stuff like that. I wonder if, if women would actually, that would actually be more like, um, you know, the sex doll for women or maybe that at this point it's actually, the, you know, sex robot. Um but, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, as you said, it is a little bit of a substitute as much like, the, you know, the sex doll. But um, I think in, in the future, potentially, it would be even more of a substitute with AI being able to fill in the role of, um, of your partner in that situation. It's, yeah, it would be an, it would be an interesting, brave new world, I would mm. think. Well, something that, that, that may be slightly related, uh, and I don't know if you've seen this or not, but recently Drew, Drew Barrymore on her awful talk show kneeled before a trans woman, uh, Dylan Mulvaney, who's that, that big uh, Instagram sort of sensation, and said, uh, do you know who dislikes me the most sometimes? Myself. And I, I think the, the point of this weird display, I guess, was to say all us girls need to love ourselves more. Uh, wh- what did you make of this weird interview? I actually didn't see it, <laughs> so but I, I'm going to go by your description of it. Um, yeah, no, it, it does. I, I, I did see descriptions of it online, and it does seem definitely a bit of like uh, you know, you know, a bit of a bit of this, a bit of a bit of uh, old guilt coming through, and you know. Um, but then at the same time, it it is it, it's interesting because it is exactly that. Um, that's what gives you brownie points in today's day age is to be a bit of a victim. And if you can make yourself out to be a bit of a victim of, you know, I'm, I'm too harsh on myself, I, I self-victimize yeah. or something like this, then, then that gives you a lot, of, a lot of brownie points. I think that's just what it is. It's a, bit of, it's a virtue signal. It's nothing, it's nothing more, nothing less. It's, it's interesting because someone like Drew Barrymore, who's so, I guess, wealthy and successful, in order to be a victim, she has to, you know, do it to herself, you know. So yeah. that's that's the only way she can be a victim is if she fesses up to the, the fact that, you know, she's, you yeah. know, she dislikes herself the most sometimes, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, John, I know you wanted us to steer away a little bit from the trans topic, but we've kind I of... I thought we could have like five minutes away from the trans stuff, but thank you. Ricky. Yeah, but I can't help myself. But, you know, this <laughs> Dylan Mulvaney has been, a you know, a self-declared woman for less than a year now and in that time has gone so far as to meet President Joe Biden. Um, I, I'm interested to, to, to get your thoughts on, on what you think this does to the psyche of young women when they see pretend women being infinitely more famous and argu- arguably more successful than they could potentially ever be, you know, and, and to see a grown woman kneel at, at his feet as well. Uh, it's interesting because it's, it is really, it is really like a, a pantomime of a woman. Like what of these trans, trans people, I'm using quotation marks on my speech there. Um, you, you see them so often where they have, like they've completely lent into a stereotype of what being a woman is. I mean, Dylan Mulvaney is one very clear example where, you know, there's, 
really honestly it's quite disturbing i i find to see those videos where he's behaving like a, a valley girl you know, a or young something. girl yeah it's really it's a little bit disturbing mm. it's 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 like you know it's not just that he's behaving like a woman it's behaving like a prepubescent 13 year old girl you know um and you, you get that one extreme of of particularly you know of men that behave like um a, but there's really a stereotype of a particular woman is what's one example and the other example is um you know the that it, it was a story about um on question time that a trans woman started uh picked up a knitting and started started knitting when she was being questioned mm. like i don't think any any women in this day and age i mean they might knit but they're not going to sit there on tv and start knitting you know um knitting and, and so that's a, that's another stereotype of, of a woman of just you know just being this like this I, I think you've type, mentioned knitting you know? before john i don't uh, think you I, like, I've been, like no that knit. I, I think that knitting is is <laughs> it, it is so obnoxious there is no subtle way like the, i've been at, i've been at training courses and stuff with a per, where we all just want to get out of there and the person next to me pulls out a bag of knitting and like starts doing it and i just want to say stop that just stop it like i'm i'm fully engaged in this boring thing we have to do put away your knitting and i mean if i got up and just started doing i don't know like juggling something you'd go i think you should try it yeah i think you should try juggling. But juggling is just yeah. as dumb as knitting isn't it like you know like isn't it both selfish well, once you knit once you finish the knitting you have a product yeah, but once though, i finish whereas... juggling i'm a wicked juggler so you know <laughs> anyway dara don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. I, I don't have any particular prejudice against knitting per se. I'm just uh, using it to illustrate that there's a, a particular type of stereotype. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know. It, it, it definitely feels like um, it feels a little bit insulting to women to see, oh, okay, that you, you dress up in the clothes, you act like a particular stereotype, and then we call you as a more perfect, perfect woman than a real woman, you know? It, it is a little bit, it's a little bit insulting. I'm almost convinced that, that he, because his early videos are actually quite funny and, and could be taken as a piss take. Like I'm almost convinced that that's how he started out as doing this comedic bit. But then all these trans people just rallied around him and went, you know, the, and, and, and trans allies rallied around him. So it's like, the, went, it's like the producers. He, went, oh, he, he set out to do this thing, yeah. you know, thing, terrible thing. And now and then it was a huge was success. A yeah. Yeah. It's like, a, I think the, the woman, not woman, but man that went viral, which had the massive bosoms doing the yes. top class. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I think there is a theory that he is actually taking the piss, mm. but obviously he's going to lose his job if he comes out as taking the piss. So oh, I can't wait. Into in a little 50 bit of a years. He will be a hero the world over. <laughs> in 50 years, the movies they're allowed to make about this stuff are going to be so funny. They're going to be so good. But for the moment, you'll lose your job. That's it. You talk about it. Yeah. So mm. you, you back yourself into a bit of a, a, a corner if you play the game. It's like, okay, you played it. Now you have to keep playing it. Well, we actually want to do a hard pivot here. Well, to go back to something we were getting into, uh, we, we talked about self-love, but we wanted to ask you some some questions about, about dating and um, and being on the scene because you've written about this uh, on your sub stack and, and, and about the place. So, um, you know, I've got a few questions out there. Uh, uh, you know, firstly, are there eligible men out there? What's the standard like? What's going on? What's What's the scene out there? What's going on? Well, I mean, it's hard to say because, I mean, you're always going to be bumped with your your biases, for starters. Like, you're always going to be stuck with the group of people unless you go on to online dating, you know, the apps, which are the whole... Do you mean different from... The, you mean hookup apps, <laughs> different from, like, online dating sort of matchmaker websites, different? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all apps these days, so, you know, it's Hinge okay. and um, uh, Tinder and Bumble. And they all have their particular quirks, but they all have the same pitfalls of being essentially, you know, shopping for your your partner in the same way you shop for Uber Eats or something. But like the this. standard of men um, out there, in your experience, and your friends as well, like like what 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 what's 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 it like in? You know, look, there? honestly, I think the men are really struggling. Yeah, uh, the men around around my age is it's a bit of a you know if, if you have your act together, you've already found someone. But if you're don't have your act together. Then, you're Andrew Tate. You know, you're, you're still, you're, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think I think the men are quite str uh, struggling comparatively to women. Um, 
it's no secret that, you know, women have on average, you know, in my generation and your generation have outperformed men in, um, you know, in various schooling and university and so on. And they've just generally got themselves to a better position at the age of 30 or whatever. And this, this creates a little bit of a, a difficulty because women on average, they, have, they, they, they choose men out by a heuristic, I would say. It's not, and it's not, it's not this, you know, Andrew Tate, uh, manosphere kind of conversation, which you hear a lot on the manosphere about women are all kind of, they say, you know, they say it in less, less blatant terms, but they say that women are all gold diggers. Um, and they go, go for you for your money and so on. And so well, my wife is a uh, terrible gold digger. If that is the case, I will let you know right now. She is the worst one. <laughs> but you hear this and, and it is true that women do you know, to go the more reasonable route of the Jordan B. Peterson is that women do select competent men, right? And what, but different women choose what, yeah, differently when it comes to competency. I have um, one of my friends, which I, I lived with when I lived in the UK, she had a friend and would go, always go after the guys with the nice cars, right? She would always be like, you know, this is the friend of the friend would always see see his car. It was like Lamborghini or something, and she would be off in a, in a second, you know. Um, and and then my friends like, oh, she's so materialistic. I can't believe it. She just goes for the men with the nice cars. And then this guy walks in and says that he had he went to Oxford, and she grows two inches and goes, oh, oh Oxford, really? <laughs> so, I mean, it is it is like that with women. But they do they do choose men based on competency and they do have like their, I would say a heuristic for what competency means. Some women like the car, some women like the Oxford degree, some women, but it depends on what they're choosing for. You know, if they're choosing a smart guy, they'll look at your PhD. If they want a, a successful or, guy, they'll Or your back catalogue of but, podcasts there, John. Mm, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, I yeah. got my wife through so, humour and I think <laughs> that if I could go back in time and tell her, I'd say maybe the Lamborghini guy probably like because he's probably a banker or something i tell her that now i go I, I tell her i go man you blew it i go you totally well, blew it but well, well i've heard you. larry david i've heard larry david say that that is total bullshit like women do not care about sense of humor dara so, may, maybe maybe is this your, true your wife john is is different uh i i well no actually that's that's not the women do care about sense of humor and there's a very good reason for that actually um I don't know if you've read any of Jeffrey Miller's books, no. but there's one called Mating Intelligence. And he talks about, as, well, what we were talking about before, he talks about art and, you know, these caveman drawings and stuff like this. And it's like, this has no particular purpose whatsoever. Why would, why would these people that were desperate for food spend their hard, uh, hard energy drawing paintings and stuff like that? Um, but actually it's, it's been, it's, it's a tangible way to, de uh, to demonstrate intelligence, put it that way. And I, actually, that is what women have chosen for for a very, very long period of time. If you look at, I don't know if you know any teenage girls, but if you look at their, their you know, the walls in their bedrooms, um, they don't have, you know, a, you know, you know muscle-bound, you know, um, only dudes have that. Body Big built, hunks. Only, yeah, only dudes. <laughs> they, don't, they don't. They don't have those. They have rock stars or musicians or actors. You know, they're all the people in the creative industries. And are, really effeminate-looking you know, men, talented but effeminate-looking yeah. men. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's not actually it's not actually a um uh, she, she, a woman that chooses for sense of humor is actually very much. Uh, I just love the idea of a, of the caveman guy putting his hand on the wall, blowing the the the, the paint all over, and stepping back and just saying, <laughs> "You ever seen one like that?" And then, <laughs> and then it's done. She's he's in. Yeah, exactly. You know, but the, well, that's that's the theory anyway. The theory is that creative intelligence um, evolved as a tangible way of. Mm. You know, it's like peacock feathers. It's a hugely costly thing to have, but it, it shows your mate value. Do you feel that, that, that while we're talking about peacocks and peacocking around, do you feel that um, now I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not looking for a wear kind of a thing here, but do you feel that uh, men still um, uh, carry a bit, of, uh, some of the, bur most of the burden when it comes to the first move, like, you know, and risking the risk of rejection? 
Um, yes, but I guess the the issue is is that much of the rejection has been moved online um, by dating apps. Um, I guess I guess the, this this is a twofold: the fact that you can get rejected, you know, forty times in a night if you just sit there swiping, um, and then on the other hand, you, they don't. Uh, you know, I think most women, reasonable women, would actually prefer a man to approach them um, in an ordinary setting, but that's verboten these days. Mm. Um, it would be nice to have a little bit more. I, I, I would like to see, and you know, maybe this is another business idea, but I'm happy for someone else to take it off me. Um, I'd like to see a, a space created where, you know, Reasonable women, not ones that are going to, you know, bite their head off or whatever the case may be, not ultra feminists that say, oh, you can't talk to me. Um, uh, a space that, that allows for uh, men and women to approach each other again um, because that's just completely uh, decimated these days. And particularly even in workplaces, there's lots of workplaces pol policies that came, you know, came out of the Me Too era where they say no, you know, no workplace relations. And But that's how... The majority of people have met their spouse in the in the past. Even my grandparents met at work. Mm. Um, was, you know, that was very rare in those days. But um, yeah, so it, it is interesting. It is, I think, um, a product of having only online as the, the space to approach women has resulted in not never experiencing rejection in real life, which you know has uh, deleterious effects of you know, being able to start a relationship because, you know, women are probably more likely to say yes in, in that instance. Um, and also that little bit of bravery is actually very attractive to some degree. Um, and then on the other hand, experiencing way too much rejection on online. So it's, it's a very interesting space to be in if you're a man. I think yeah, the, pro the problem is, is that men that do have uh, more of a, backbone or I don't even want to say backbone because sometimes they're you know the reason why they can stomach so much rejection is not for good reasons that they're a little bit lacking, lacking in, Patrick Bateman you know empathy or whatever Pat, yeah yeah so <laughs> the problem the, pro the problem is is that you know it, it ends up being women you know the winner takes all is that the man that can you know court women off the street and I have actually accepted a number off the street from a man and completely reject <laughs> it was one of the creepiest dates I've been on um, but it's, you know, it, <laughs> Come on, you can't leave that there, Dara. come on. <laughs> oh, I, I was, I was in London. I was standing on, you know, the Piccadilly Circus, the famous corner mm. Mm -hmm. and under the light, cause I was meeting someone and this guy approaches me and he full panache, you know, bow tie, three piece suit, the whole shebang goes, comes up to me and says, oh, you're very pretty or something like that. Um, Is he posh? And can I get your number? Yeah, very posh. Mm. <laughs> uh, can I get your number? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, I have never, like, I've literally never been approached before by a man. Like, this is like the first time that this has ever happened. This was before I went anywhere near Latin, part of Europe where they do it all the time. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like flabbergasted. This, okay, this is the first time this has happened. Here's my number. You know, he texts me. I text back. I go on a, I go on a date and then, you know, to put it bluntly, you know, he the first thing, the first when I first sat down, the hand went on the knee, and then he started trying to kiss me. I oh, moved God. away. Then he moved closer. Then I moved away, and then he moved closer. I'm like, okay, let's. I'm just going to pay for this bill because I don't want any, you know, further what a know, creeper interaction. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, a couple of years ago, I came up with this idea for a dating show. Okay. So maybe I can pitch it to you. I actually pitch it to a few people. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that, but that there are millions of Chinese men out there that would never find women because of the one child policy. So my idea is, is that we take a handful of Aussie Sheilas, we go to China, we do a fish out of water kind of show, and they try and find love in China with, with you know, the eligible men that are out there. And I call it year of the man. What do you think? Alternate title, Red Hot Love. Oh. <laughs> what do you think? That's good. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if it would go down well with Aussie Sheilas. Mm. You have to find some reason to sell this because, unfortunately, 
it's not that men are in short supply necessarily it's quality men so that you need to have some way of guaranteeing the you know but the, but there must be a few quality men out there that are going to miss out because the discrepancy in 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 female to male ratio is is off off the charts over there like uh, there, there are literally millions and millions of, of, of Chinese men that will just never, never find, never find a partner. Yeah. So I don't yeah, know. Well, Chances you, might you be can, good. You can, yeah, you can, you can try. You can replace it with some, uh, eight, you know, television channels and see how All you right, go. Ricky, it sounds like a pass to me. So uh, the, the, <laughs> yes. the, the, um, uh, the, the project's a pass. It's, it's, we've moved on from that. So, so, I got, I, so we've talked about the, the, the apps and, and everything being, um you know obviously it's very transactional and uh you know it's it's at scale now but has this sort of uberification and the and perhaps also the availability of of porn and the um you know um made people sort of treat dating and and sex like they're a customer like you know i have this example of uh one of my wife's friends you know, people are asking for kinky stuff way too early. Like, like, or, or they're revealing, they've got like preferences. Like this guy was like, it was the second date or something. And he's like, oh, come out in a, in a one piece swimsuit. Like, like, you know, and, and it's just, that's way early for this stuff. Like, like, shouldn't all of this be, I don't know, like, um, happening later. I mean, is, is, is the, is all of this stuff on demand and the, and the fact that it's like a website now or just an app and we're just swiping and clicking and putting in our preferences and we're all attached to our preferences and we want all of it now. Like, I mean, is, how is this all working out? Uh, not very well. I think it's not so much that we're attached to our preferences. It's just that the apps make everything feel like there's so many people out there and we need to narrow the field. So we put in preferences that are designed to narrow the field, but obviously, have, you know, that does it too much. Um, but, yeah, it, it, I think there's a few things happening. I think there's a very, there's different cultures on different apps. So Tinder is definitely the hookup app and everyone on there is there for different reasons. And that's, that's the downside with an app like Tinder because everyone is on Wouldn't there. Wouldn't it be better if it was called Sexer? So if it was like sexer and then we all knew that that's what you were there for and there was no one on yeah. there say, want, dating with intention or anything and it's just like, yeah. you know, wouldn't that be easier? Why yeah. are we... Yeah, that would, that would be so much easier. Um, but I guess there is a plausible den deniability if you're on Tinder that you're looking for something serious or at least I think for women, maybe it's also a little bit of a, a lie to yourself because, you know, you're, you're like, okay you know, I hook up with this guy, but maybe it will be turned into something else. You know, it's not the, the lines between relationship and, um, you know, hook up are fairly blurred. Would you, would you prefer it? Uh, I love this topic, by the way, Dara. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I'm a very boring <laughs> man. So, the, but, but would you prefer it if, if there was a, I think we might have already touched on this. You talked about a place where men and women can meet online or whatever. Would you prefer that there was a space created where the price for entry was that you were, you were serious, like you were like you were definitely serious, and you weren't you weren't just. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think I was going to say, oh, maybe you could be there. For, no, I think you should be serious. I think you should go in there, and it should be like, no, no, we're all. How do you how do you prove your seriousness though? Well, I actually, I'm actually, uh, I signed up to a matchmaker and the, the fact that, you know, you're serious is because it costs a bloody bomb. Um, that's it. It's got, there's got to be a fee involved. Yeah. It's, it's very expensive. Um, but I'm still, I actually, I'm still not convinced with the matchmaker mainly because I think I might be a little bit different because clearly they're picking out all these people that I'm like, oh, no, I don't think they're matched me, for me. And then I go on a date with them. And I'm like, mm, still not, a, that's still very, I'm still very skeptical. And then they text me going, I don't think we're a match. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I don't think we're a match either. Um, but I think, I think that, you know, I, I just don't know. I think I'm a little bit weird in, in that I'm, I'm more or less looking for someone which shares my values. But when they ring up and tell me, I have this guy who really likes 70s rock and going on long drives in the country. I'm like, that doesn't tell me anything about him. I don't know. Like, how do I know what I, I'm, I'm partial to 70s rocks and I don't mind going on drives to the country, but like they're very, you know, I, they're not really things that I would choose the main. But when you say values, but, you know, uh, I do, does politics play a part in this? Yeah, I actually do think it does. Um, 
I when I which is partly my fault when I went there I'm like I'm fairly open-minded these are my what I do this is what I am this is the religion I practice I don't like my my, my main thing is someone that is open to coming along to the things that I like you know mm. um but in, hi- in hindsight, I'm now realizing that I maybe should be a little bit more strict with that. And this, this is the problem with, you know, having too many options in some respects. Not that I'm like a great beauty, but definitely I think, you know, in, in the realm that I play, you know, the, the spaces that I am in, it tends to be more men. So it's, it is just the fact that there is, I do need to narrow the field down slightly. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is interesting that, the, da- the downside with having too many options, like with Tinder, is that you, you then you start to narrow the field. So if there are, you know, in Tinder, it's pretty much like, oh, I'm going to select for height, I'm going to select for you know, X, Y, Z. But if you select for people only that, you know, share your politics or share this or share that, um, you also cut out a lot of people that could be, you know, great partners. I have had great partners that did not share my politics whatsoever, but, you know, we got along on a very human level. Um, so yeah, it, it is, it is interesting. Like it, it's very hard to find a partner. I think one of the, one of the major issues with finding a partner in these day, this day and age is that we're actually so, um, previously the person next door would share your values, share your religion, share your, you know, cultural background. And there would be no, um, you know, there would be no difficulty really in, in starting a relationship with the boy next door or the girl next door. But today... I don't know. I don't actually don't think the person next door would share any of those things. So you need to go further afield. And then, then China, you end up with maybe? an infinite. Yeah, it's a China <laughs> maybe. <you know? laughs> Red hot love. <laughs> All right, you sold me. Sign me up. <laughs> uh, excellent, excellent. Wonderful. John, you can be executive producer. Um, Thank you. We'll, we'll do yeah, but I, I think that's one of the main problems is that we're, we're looking for partners, but we're also inculcated in such different cultures and values because we spend so much bloody time online. We we end up with weird politics that only can come about if you've, you know, spent last week looking at all the issues around trans people in Australia, you know. <laughs> well, is, um, is the neo-trad red-pilled movement like what we see with, with internet sensation, just pearly things, a backlash against modern dating and and modern relationships. Um, do, do you know who Just Pearl is? I uh, yes, I have seen her, but yeah. I don't. I haven't watched like, a lot of her content. She's like the female Kevin Samuels. So she, yeah, she's very much into um, yeah dating with intention. Yeah, uh, with you intention. know, uh, yeah. wife school uh, sort of anti promiscuity and she probably anti pill. Yeah skeptical of of a lot of the left wing stuff and and also trying to get you know some extreme women to um to question their choices as well so she was the, the big part of that movement is just saying you know would you date a guy who made less than you know a hundred grand a year or something and they're like no mm. you know and he's he's, he's so mm. yeah it's that's who she is yeah uh yeah, I know. I, I have looked at some of the content of similar people, like um, classically Abby, Ben Shapiro's sister. Have you watched no. any of her content? It's very no. similar, very oh. similar, like, you know, um, you know, she, she's very homely. She does a lot of cooking. She talks about, you know, saving, you know, saving yourself for your husband and, you know, anti-promiscuity and all this sort of stuff as well. Very similar kind of, like, you know, but... Uh, I wouldn't, Trav, Trav Wife is more going back to, you know, what something is going, is having a, you know, a, a libertine moment and then retreating back. But this is more like someone that's done that all the time, which I, I actually find a little bit um, difficult to compute because how do you know, like, if you've never experienced the inverse of that, how do you know that what you have is better? I think per- but- Pearly, just Pearl calls it a hoe phase. I believe. Ho face, yeah. I mean, you don't have to have a ho face necessarily, <laughs> but <laughs> but I, you know, I think it is. Yeah, it is. I do find it goes a little bit too far. A lot of the both the red pill and the you know the trad space goes a little bit too far. And I mean, it's, it's sort of inevitable that there would be a backlash. Really, it's been too much sex positivity for so long um, that. 
it's, it's sort of inevitable that there is a backlash. And that's, you know, what I don't know if you've seen any of Catherine D's con content, um, Default Friend, who talks, has been talking about a long time about that's going to be a, a wave of sex ne negativity. Um, and it can so, it, the, this sort of content is exactly, you know, your Andrew Tate's, although it's sex negatively only for women, um, but, you know, a lot of the trad content is, you know, going in this direction. I think it's a little bit of a too much of an extreme. I don't like either extreme. I don't like the libertine, you know, do what you feel like all the time, my body, my choice, I can do whatever I want with it. Um, but I also don't like the, you know, uh, too much into this uh, Brad uh, way of looking at, at sex where it's a bit more like, um, you know, it, it, it does have, it does have like a, a bit of a, you know, it, it does degrade it, in, but in a different way, you know, it's, it's on one hand we're deep pedalist, you know, deep pedest pedestalized sex by making it, you know, too pedestrian. It's too, everything goes, you know, I, my favorite is, um, story is during the start of COVID in Canada, they released some pamphlets around like some advertising material saying, you know, it's probably not safe to kiss people if, if you don't want to contract COVID, but what is safe is if you use a glory hall. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. so, so introducing uh, completely fringe, uh, like truck stop, <laughs> truck stop sex uh, devices into a, just an average relationship. That's good. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and that, but if you, if you think about it, if a, if a deadly virus is on the loose, we can do everything, you know, we can lock people in their houses, whatever the case may be, um, but we cannot pe tell people to forego sex. Like, you know, that's, that's too far, too far, too far. So we're, we're going to tell them instead of, you know, you know, maybe have sex, you know, safely with your partner. Or whatever the case may be, we're just going to tell them to use glory holes because that's hard. I don't think you can. I mean, look, I, I think I believe in forgiveness, but I think if you or your partner have constructed a glory hole, like you sanded it and done all of that, I don't think there's a lot. Of, I don't think it's coming back from that. Yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't think so either. But that was just what, like my favorite story. That that's that shows you the culture that we're living in. It's like, if, you know, the government t takes great pains to tell you that. Please don't go outside without a mask. But also, if you do have sex with someone, use a glory hole. Like. But but also that the sexual <laughs> act has been reduced to a hole and someone's yeah. member. You know, so it's a, it's a yeah. pole. It's a pole Ricky. and a hole, and that's that's what sex is. That's it. That's it. It's no. There's no face to face contact. There's no connection whatsoever. Yeah, and that's that's, that's exactly that's exactly what. That's um, whenever you put the government in charge of this. That's what they think it is. <laughs> Like they just go, they, you know, it just becomes a goon dungeon, you know, <laughs> something gross. So yeah, but I, I'm, yeah, I don't, I don't like where either of this goes. I think it is, it's far better to, you know, make, make sex sacred again, but it doesn't have to be sacred to the extent of, you know, of it being completely um, something, you know, that you, that you leave for marriage. Yeah. So you think there's there's a middle ground there that that that, that yeah. sort of is the best place yeah. to be, yeah. Well, I think I think this has been a great trailer for the all minus one events. Um, I haven't been to one yet because uh, I'm in Melbourne, but I hope they're just like uh, our discussion today. Uh, you've been so uh, generous with your time. We, we we you know we've got one last question that we ask all of our guests, and that is uh, we'd like to know what you're reading right now. Um, I'm actually reading the female eunuch for the first time ever. Uh, Jermaine Greer's book. Um, I had to I had to read something else because I knew this question was coming, <laughs> and I didn't want to admit to my my other my other read. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> come on, what was it? Uh, oh no, it's, it, 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 I, I have to tell a bit of a story with that one. But um, you know, it, it's actually interesting because one of the things that I'm thinking about a lot at the moment, and I don't want to give the you know, give away the essay that I'm trying to write at the moment, but you know, who cares? Um, uh, but I'm thinking a lot about the place of the body in current culture, and the that we seem to be within you know two extremes. On one hand, we have the body positivity movement that says you know 
you're, you know, you're healthy at any size, doesn't matter how much you weigh or what, what the problem is, like, you know, you know, you're beautiful, you know, don't change anything, whatever. Um, and then on the other hand, we have this other movement which says that if you are unhappy with your, you know, your gender, you can change it. Doesn't matter how young you are, doesn't matter how, you know, how much intervention is required for that. Uh, and then on the other, you know, they also have, you know, non-gender affirming surgeries, like, you know, all these women that want plastic surgery so that their face looks like the filter on the, you know, on the phone. Um, so we have, the, we're running these two programs simultaneously that the body is perfect as it is, don't need to change anything, it doesn't matter how much you weigh. But on the other hand, if you're unhappy with anything, go, go for gold, you know, do whatever, you can change it, mash it up, cut it up, whatever, all good. Um, and it seems to be very much in conflict with one another. And it's interesting reading the female eunuch, you know, in this time when we're talking about trans and all this sort of stuff um, and seeing that in some ways things haven't changed all that much, that we, we already have, were running some of these programs before. Um, it's just that they've taken on a very different, uh, you know, different way of, of, of being enacted because we have all these surgeries now we have all this technology in some way that is advancing you know the cause of you know the transhumanist idea on one side and then on the other side um we have all this uh opulence today you know we have so much drunk food and um there's so there's so many ways in which you could simply be on the hedonistic tre treadmill forever you know you can eat whatever you want you know, watch whatever you want, sit on sit on the telly or whatever the case may be. Um, and so, yeah, it, 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 it is, it is thought-provoking in some respects. Well, well we, we watched um, uh, a documentary that she was in recently um, uh, for another, an, another episode. Uh, it's on YouTube. It's called Town Bloody Hall, where she uh, leads a debate against um, with a, some other feminists against Norman Mailer, a great male narcissist. And... <laughs> The, first, the the thing we noticed about about um, that second wave moment and now was the complete lack of humor we have now. The, so so the women were going hard and Jermaine was going hard at, at Norman. He was going hard at them. But from the audience, people were guffawing and laughing and sort of there was a it was there was a, a well dare I say an eros about it as well to to quote uh, uh, um, Amina Melonic, one of our other guests. Uh, um, so the, uh, that w that humour is I think is completely missing now. Yeah, there are definitely no shrinking violets. You know the the women and the fe you know the feminist movement of the bygone era, and I I don't think you could say the same for. You know the, you know the women that are that are the forefront today. They seem to be very fragile and don't want to have their opinions challenged or um, these sorts of things. But I think that is that's probably the the cause of that is because it's been so successful. You have got all these ordinary women um, on board that want to do it because it's the fashionable thing. But the thing about people that want to do something because of the fa it's the fashionable thing is that they don't really want to take heat for it. Um, so it's interesting that we're, we're in a moment where feminism has become so vogue that, you know, that women that don't really um, want to engage in this public discourse are now taking part, of it, part in it. And because of that, we've got this, you know, feminist movement that is very much um, about you know, conformist, conforming to whatever, whatever the case is at the moment. Well, I think that's probably the topic of our next discussion, uh, Dara. Uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up uh, again. Thank you so much for, for making time to talk to us. Thank you. It was good to be here again. <laughs> and everyone should go uh, to All Minus One if you're in Sydney. Uh, go uh, check that out. And where else can people find you online? Um, I have a Substack, uh, Dara McDonald's substack.com and yeah but all minus one is the main one fantastic we'll talk to you again thanks dara
Thank you for listening to the New Flesh podcast. If you like our work, please consider rating us on Apple Podcasts or even writing us a review. It really does help the show reach a wider audience. We'll be back with another episode next week. Until then, long live the New Flesh.